Let's bring in Post House Capital CEO and former head of Square Capital, Jackie Reeses. Jackie, great to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Until this most recent rally, um, it has been a long, hard slog for a lot of these names. And I'm wondering if, if this results in some sort of reckoning in the space. Well, I think we've seen the reckoning in the last seven months. I mean, it's been tough since uh, the end of November. And if you look even year to date, the Nasdaq's down 20 percent. E-commerce enablement is down 35. All of these stocks have been absolutely impacted by inflationary pressure, where CPI is at 8.3 percent, the 10-year Treasury is at 2.9 percent, commodity prices like oil up to $112 a barrel. And so even the volatility that we saw today and over the last month has really impacted this sector. But I think it's really overdone. And if you look at the performance relative to the growth of these companies, you'll see that it is misaligned and that these companies have taken a battering more than the relative overperformance that they've had. Because if you actually look at, at decomposing the multiples and the multiple compression, you'll see that most of the change in their valuations have been related to multiples, not performance, which today continues to be very strong. The concern, though, for investors is that on top of this multiple compression because of high valuation names getting a lower valuation in this kind of market, there's the next shoe to drop, and that's the impact on consumers with delinquencies. Delinquencies among subprime borrowers, at least, has actually they've actually gone up. And so, can you can you help us understand, you know, if the consumer if consumer credit continues to deteriorate, how it affects these various companies because it affects them in very different ways. Absolutely. And there is a bifurcation between those that have asset light balance sheets and those that don't. And so there's a wide swath of the payments market, the software companies that don't actually lean into any loans on their balance sheet. But while there obviously are some names that are very balance sheet heavy, like mortgage lenders, uh, those in buy now, pay later and other other credit markets, I do think you'll see an impact on the consumer. Um, as the markets change, as rates go up. But so far, we haven't seen it come into the data today. Hey, Jackie, it's Karen. Thanks for being on. Um, so you talk about the multiples having come down a lot, but the multiples were in, you know, just crazy territory. And so they've come down. But it, what what is the right number for where they've come down and they're reasonable? Some of them still seem very expensive on uh, many metrics. Yeah, you know, I, the, the metric that I use is that they were about 12 times revenue, and now they're about 3.7 times revenue. And when you look over time, today they're below pre-COVID levels in terms of like a long-term growth trajectory. And so there is some overall resetting back to a more normative level of performance on these multiples. And so I, I do think that period of time between March 2020, or maybe it's May 2020, and then November of 2021 was probably more abnormal, and we're back down on a slope. But again, as I said, I think the fintech multiples, particularly some of the payments and crypto multiples, have been hurt relative to, to their growth rate. And so I do think they'll reset back to a more steady state, higher levels. But I think it'll take a few quarters to see that balance out and have the sector come back to a, a more moderate level of performance. Jackie, I want to uh, zero in on, on the last statement that you said in, in response to my question. And you said we haven't seen it in the numbers yet in terms of consumer weakening. What happens when we do start to see it in the numbers? I mean, how, how should we think about that for something like a buy now, pay later company like an Affirm? I mean, I would think that it would indicate that perhaps you're, the pool to whom you extend buy now, pay later becomes smaller. And so the growth trajectory for the company also slows down. And maybe that's not priced in yet. You know, I won't speak to any one company in particular. I'll speak to the industry mm -hmm. overall. I think there are some interesting dynamics of these companies, which is their short duration, high velocity loans. And so the ability to adjust performance on loans in the buy now, pay later industry is incredibly agile. And so I think what you'll see happen is that they'll increase the credit performance as it relates to who gets a loan. So they'll shrink the credit box and so you will start to see some adjusting over time as the consumer credit markets tighten. But as of today, you haven't seen that. And so these lenders are able to continue to lend because of their ability to adjust so agilely versus those that are in long duration products like mortgage lenders, where they have to make credit decisions based on a 30 year performance of a loan payback. 
And so I do think there's some credit being paid to that. I also think these kinds of companies have the ability to take their loans and play in an asset light model. And so, so long as liquidity operates in the market, whether that be securitizations or a private financing market, you'll see the ability to take those loans, sell them off balance sheet, and continue to evolve their performance over time. Mm -hmm. Jackie, I hope we'll see you soon again. Thank Jackie you. Reese's. Good to see you. All right, Karen, you've dug into this space a lot. Uh -huh. You own some of these names, and so I'm wondering how you're thinking um, about it in light of, of what's going on I in the market. I don't anymore, actually. Oh, you don't I anymore. bought a firm, sold a firm, okay. bought PayPal, sold PayPal. However, I do own banks, right? Yeah. And um, to the extent that you're where you're going with credit, right, if it, you know, if it affects a firm or a square capital or someone like that, it's going to affect banks as well. So um, that's concerning that it's we're just at the very beginning of seeing credit quality sort of begin to deteriorate it hasn't even done that yet so that's somewhat concerning i still think though that so they, there's a bounce there but they just seem high i hear what she's saying down that they're down 70 some odd percent interesting so you, you made a great point about subprime and, and the defaults that are coming right now okay so you would have uh, a couple years ago been able to say okay these guys just benefit from the secular shift of online payments and this uh, but they all moved in to buy now pay later right so we know that square bought a company we know that paypal bought a company i think paypal does not have a whole heck of a lot of exposure not the way obviously a firm and square do now they paid 29 billion dollars in stock for that company here's the thing about paypal jackie just said this this stock is not even only come back to its pre-pandemic highs, it got back to its match lows from March of 2020 here. It's down 75%. This is a company that's probably going to grow earnings and sales, let's say mid-teens for the next few years or so. That makes sense to me versus in a firm, which is also down 75%, which is not expected to be profitable for like four years or something like that. So I think that not all fintechs are kind of, you know, I mean, I think there's going to be lots of opportunities and some very quality names. Bono, and just quickly, what's your pick in the space? <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> I like PayPal. I also like Square. I think it's here in the present and the future. You have uh, actual Square. That's for transactions of SMEs. You actually have the Cash App. I think that like addresses a large cohort. And then you have like the future upside related to blockchain.